Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm excited to see some people or a lot of people excited to learn more about data. And and I hope you all are enjoying Drupal GovCon 2023. I'm happy that we are back in person. That's so good. Um, I'm really enjoying my time here. This is the second time that I've been honored to be a speaker in a golf course. And I want to mention that the global community is always great. Um, but this is the second day, though. And we are almost at the end of the day. It can be a bit overwhelming as well, right? I can imagine that you all are feeling that you have had an overflow of information. <laughs> You're meeting people, you know about deployments, about UX, what's new in Drupal, what's new in government, even artificial intelligence. And it's been fantastic. But at the same time, it can feel like you cannot retain more information because you need to digest all the knowledge that you've acquired. You might be wondering, what of all this is useful to me? Do I want to engage in learning something more deeply? If I need to share the highlights of this talk, what will do this be? Well, while this talk may not help you to make those decisions, I think we all can agree that having too much information can be a problem especially if you don't know what's relevant or what pieces offers value. So let's dive in. I am Yvonne Carrillo, Principal Data Engineer at Vixel. We are the ones with the rubber duckies. <laughs> <laughs> and I am part of the Artificial Intelligence and Data Engineering team. In my time at Vixel, I have the opportunity to work in Drupal projects as well, as a backend developer and as a tech lead. And in my role in the, as a data engineer, I've been using Drupal as a data source. So it's the origin of that content. And Drupal has a lot of content. So there's a lot of to do there. In this talk, I'm going to break down this sentence. From data to smart decisions. But what data, what decisions, and why we are saying that they are smart? Let's just start with the data. So what content do we have? We are working with government content. This can be content about policies, about public services. So what we can do is assessing those existing and new policies, optimization of those public services, enhancing emergency response, highlighting the transparency and accountability of the agencies. And all this will give insights to our clients so they can make decisions. And I put this in a cycle because those decisions can generate even more content. And it's, it's like a nice, a positive cycle there. Oops. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not good with this. Okay. So my computer is loading. <laughs> it's loading the next slide. But I want to talk about those decisions. So we are not making those decisions. It is, a, it is on the government side. It is our clients that are making those decisions. Let me see if I can restart this. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> well, if someone can help me here, I will really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. But, so I'm not meaning that we are going to be working on making those decisions, but what we can do is working on here. <laughs> what we can do is help on streamlining that data capture. So we can help our clients 
Do you know what are the data points that can be relevant to them so they can answer those questions? We can help on optimizing the reporting that they do. We can even build a self-service analytics. And what we are going to do with this is influencing the decision-making process that they have. So one thing that we have to do first in order to help them or to achieve those products is to know what is the business of our client. What is it that they do? So we can start by asking some questions because we want to know the big picture. We want to know the context in which our users are working first. We cannot jump in into be solving problems if we don't even know what the problems are. Okay, yeah, government decisions, we're not making them. <laughs> we're going fast here. <laughs> this is what I was talking about. So we can help on working on products that will be influencing those government decision-making processes. And there we go, we have even more questions, more examples of questions. But the goal here is to know the context in which our clients are working on. So, yeah, as I was saying, what are the processes, what is their vision, their goals, the public that they are serving, what are the obstacles, and finally, how my website fits in the business needs. Because we want to know, we're already working with a website, so we know they are, it is solving a problem, but we want to know the whole context. Once we know that context, we want to work in identifying those gaps or areas of opportunities in which we can work. And we can use resources such as customer journey maps. So show hands who has worked with customer journey maps before. Awesome. I will explain what it is. So here we will have a persona and a scenario. This will be the starting point of this user. Goals and expectations. This is what this user wants to go. And then we are going to be identifying the phases and the user actions that this persona is going to take in order to achieve those goals and expectations. Then we are going to describe the user experience and what they are thinking. And on those lows is where we are going to be identifying those opportunities and that's what we are going to work on. I'm going to illustrate this with three examples. The first one, this is a, a made up one, just to put us in the mindset of the customer journey maps. So we have Jose. Jose is a Drupal developer that needs to downstream the site content to a data project. In this context, downstream means that we are going to moving data from Drupal to another data source, to another project. And Drupal is going to be the origin, so we're going to call it the upstream system. And the, our data product is going to be the downstream system. And the goal is to find the best solution to share the content. So we're going to identify the phases. In this case, will be awareness, consideration, decision and use, and advocacy. In the first one, Jose is going to be asking around for help, and then go to Drupal.org to search for modules that can accomplish this goal. The experience is not very positive because there's some confusion in there. Then he decides to compare some different modules. The experience is going a little bit better. Then he decides to use one of them. The experience goes down again because it's not working. So there's some frustration there, but it's finally working. And then it goes so well that he decides to reduce this module in other projects. So in these laws, we can identify or propose some solutions. For example, and a message about this is contributed by the, com the, the, the community, and some video <coughs> tutorials. And by the way, I saw these things are already happening in Drupal.org. I just put it as an example. So it's not something that is lacking. This is an example uh, of a use case that we have a big 
So in a contract, we have this project manager that needs to generate a monthly report. So in the first area, oh, I think it doesn't look really well, but I will describe it. So it's the awareness phase. It's the first week of the month, and Joe needs to prepare a reporting plan first to, to start the report of the previous month. The experience is not super positive because Joe needs to do a repetitive job that is prone to human mistakes. So he decides to consider a project dashboard that we developed for this same uh, purpose. So Joe is going to go to this project dashboard that is already collecting the data, that it is presenting the metrics that he needs, and he clicks around in the different dashboards like web analytics, events data, program indicators, but the experience is just not positive. There are too many steps, it's confusing. So one possible solution will be to create a more effective landing page and maybe set those filters to the previous mode by default. So the next time that Joe goes to the dashboard, he will see the numbers that he's used to see. He's going to see the, the same behaviors on those metrics. So that will create more trust. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in, the, in, in the last phase. So Joe figured it out. He's ready to generate this report. The experience first is not Super positive because Joe doesn't know the report that is going to do output because there's no verification step. There's no way to from, for Joe to know what's going to be the final report. So possible solution will be to add a report preview. That will also generate a little bit more of trust and he will be able to see what the output will be before generating the report. Once the report is done, he's happy. The experience is better because it was less steps, fewer mistakes, less back and forth with the client, that it got approved faster. So it's, it's going well. And this last step is something that we were suggesting. If the dashboard is already presenting the metrics that are required, for the report, maybe the report is redundant. We can remove that. But the response wasn't as positive as we thought. Because people want what they already know. It's really hard to break those habits. So show us if that has happened to you before. That you are, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you are excited, you found a, a way to do, to optimize the process to make it more effective, and then you say it's like, no, that's great, but the way that I do it works. So one possible solution here, you need to work on generating that trust. And this step is obviously beyond the data team, but one thing that we can do, for example, is those little things like add a report preview, maybe show different months of that show metrics of reports that has been approved before. So when we show the new one, you're going to see this, the kind of the same behavior in those numbers, so that can generate trust, like okay, the numbers are accurate. One other thing can be to present, okay, this is a month, this is how it looked last year. So that will start creating more, uh, more trust. But also start with a small steps. One thing that we could have done is just the data collection and let the project manager to generate that report manually and then take it from there. But also, other thing that we could do is add more insights. Just make this dashboard more attractive so users have a reason to go, at least to, to see those other insights, maybe some correlations, maybe some predictive analytics, and give them the opportunity to play around with these metrics. So I want to show you one more um, customer journey map. I, I wanted to show you that you can use this 
even if you don't have a product that the user is already using. So normally you're going to use it for products or services, but also just to present or visualize a process. And this will tell you the lack of that product and can help you with gathering requirements as well. So for example, we have a case of also project manager. So, sorry for the project managers, I feel like I'm <laughs> putting on the spot, on the spot here. <laughs> but let's say that this project manager needs to build a team for a new contract. So it's a situation that I think we all can relate to. The first step is ask around to other managers to see if they know people, if they have the skills, and the years of experience. The experience, uh, let's say, that it's all negative because not everyone knows everyone. They don't know if they have those skills. There's confusion because maybe they know someone that has PHP skills, but they don't know if they have advanced skills. And also, so there's a lot of assumptions made here. And also it could be that the role does not align with people's growth plan. So they are planning to grow this way and the role is taking them there. So maybe that's something that uh, they want. Then once they have identified these people, the project manager goes and asks individually to verify if they have the skills and years of experience. And the information is up to date, so the experience is good. And of course, because they are going directly to the source. So here we are identifying something that the project manager wants to keep. Finally, the team is complete and ready to work. The experience is not as good because, yeah, the team is complete, but it took longer than expected. So what we can identify here is like, OK, we need a repository of employees. So let's say that, that there's no HR applications yet that doesn't have this. So there, there will be a repository of those skills with the people's goals and expectations and skills that they want to learn. So we are going to be fulfilling those requirements. But also, there was something that they want to keep that was working. So we need to add some governance there some policies, and maybe some checks to verify that those policies are new. So well, here we know the context of the client, and we have identified gaps or questions that they have or problems. The next step is to do some data discovery. Here we want to see if we can address those issues with the data that we have. For example, with the monthly report, we knew we didn't have limitations of the data because the project manager was already extracting that data and was already generating that report. But we needed to see if we could automate that process. So is the data fit for the business needs? For example, let's say that we have PDFs, so we have a lot of PDFs. So we are extracting um, some data from those PDFs, but we find out that we need some human intervention there to evaluate some of the data, to evaluate if we are getting some of the goals. So maybe we will need to add some sentiment analysis in there, or maybe natural language processing there. We need to be sure that we have the data to do that kind of solutions. Also, too much data can be a problem. For example, Nowadays, a lot of people are using the smartwatches, and they give us all sort of metrics. One of them is the heart rate. But not all users know what to do with that number, or not all the time. Let's say that someone is watching TV, and suddenly they get an alert that the heart rate is low. They want to know what to do. So sometimes, that could cause some confusion, and even some anxiety. And we don't want that. We don't want to be providing data that can cause confusion to our users. We want to provide the right data to the right users at the right time. So we need to address 
the problem of having too much data, and scope those data points that are really relevant. We want to reduce data bias and data, size, data silos. All these issues will make our data analysis harder. But also, if we address them, we will be prepared to do AI solutions as well. And lastly, do data profiling. This is describing the data that we have. So in the same example of the PDF, let's say that we have a date, we have some text, and then some numbers. So we want to say that what kind of data is that? The date is of that date, then the text is a string, and that number is decimals with some precision. And also, we want to verify the quality of that data. If we have missing values, if we can fix some errors in there. So all that will be part of the data profiling. And this work is called the data value assessment. So when a client is asking us if they can jump into doing data work or even AI, we need to do first this data value assessment and the output of this will be the response of our clients. And we will use all the content that we have, the PDFs, the forms that our sites can contain, or Excel files, or every, every type of content and data that we have. And how Drupal adds value into all this process? Well, Drupal is our data collection tool, or one of them. In, ex in the example of the skills application, we could use Drupal to be collecting that data and then pushing it and to, to a data analysis. For the monthly report that I was talking about, Drupal was one of our data sources. Actually, most of the data was coming from there. But also, that website had some services that we were using there, like Google Analytics and other third parties uh, services that we had in there. So in the same way that Drupal is using it, we can integrate those in our data products. And finally, we can integrate visualization tools in our Drupal site. We may have a custom React application visualizing that data, and we can embed that into our site. Even if we are using Tableau or Power BI, we can embed those dashboards into Drupal. Now, if we have identified that we, can, that we want to do this process based on a certain cadence, that's when we need data engineering. And what this means is that we are going to be automating the process of moving data from one place to another. So the origin, as we were saying, can be Drupal and those third party services and the destination will be a data storage where we are going to have a structured data. That's what, there can be some ex exceptions or caveats, but that's the, the, as a rule of thumb, that's the goal, to have a structured data. So what is that? When we say structured, we mean tables, so columns and rows, that's it. It can be a CSV, it can be an Excel file, it can be a database, of course, and if we have more complex requirements, it can be a data warehouse or a data lake as well. So the way that in which we are going to be collecting or extracting the data from Drupal, you can use the JSON API module that it has by default, and then our data pipeline will be processing those nested JSON files and transforming, form, transforming them into those uh, CSVs or tables. We can use GraphQL. This is especially useful if we want to do some data mining in, in your site. So data mining is about identifying some patterns on, on large data sets. If, you, if your site is already using content management, so this is generating YAML files with all your content. So we can leverage that and pass that to our data pipeline, process those YAML files, and convert those into tables. So regardless of if you decide to automate this process or it's just a one-time 
analysis, you want to have effective communication. You don't want to send those CSV files to your client because the client can be like, I don't know what to do with it. To, to do with this, or they can interpret those in a different way that you meant. So we need to present our findings in a visual format, because people understand facts and learn more easily when information is presented in a visual format. We can quickly identify patterns, connections, trends, and outliers even in data sets. And we want to use data storytelling techniques. Even when we're using a chart, we want to be sure that our users are interpreting the, those visualizations in the way that we meant. So we can have like marks, tool tips. If we want to say that we hit the goal in a certain month, we want to put a mark in there, for example. And what are my options for this uh, presentation of your findings. So we can use reports. Obviously the government report will be different than this. It will have like more narrative, more tables, but that's the idea. Those can be a, for a one-time analysis or maybe an automated process. We could use infographics. This is for a one-time analysis. You want to present what has, what has happened in the past or the current state of the business. You can use a collection of charts. For example, here we have our KPIs and it is supported with some bar charts. And obviously we can use dashboards. Those could be static or interactive. This will give the opportunity to your users to do some discovery by their own, by changing the filters, some drill down, and other features that, where they can make some correlation on their own metrics. Or it can be a complete solution, like a service service analytics. So there's no one perfect image to convey the concept that self-service is, but what I mean by this is you will have a data product or data platform where your client or your users can integrate their own business intelligence tool, they can query directly the data, they can do their own data analysis, and even use that data for machine learning purposes. So up to here, we can say that we have finished our project. But the reality, as, as, as I mentioned, this can be the output to make more decisions, and that will generate more content. So we need to do all over again everything, every time that we want to um, enhance our, our process. So what is it that we would need to do? First, discover what are the agency pain points. What is the information that they are looking for now? Assessing the data that we have and verify if we can address those key questions. Use, and lastly, use the right data visualization techniques to communicate insights. And with that, you can empower your client to make informed and impactful decisions. Thank you very much. You can do this work with existing websites. So it's not like you need to generate a new Drupal website. They already have content. And you can do this, uh, the data discovery, and find out how you can uh, use it to make, um, to help your client to make decisions. So to see if you, if you can even do that. But it can be any website. It doesn't mean that you need to build something new. Yeah, for sure. Uh, 
visualization tools do you recommend? Um, like J4, um, Flipgrid, or anything? I guess it depends on what your client is already using. Oh, if they, okay. Yeah, because, and also what they are familiar with. Some clients will request Tableau, for example. They, that's what they know, and that's what you can use. And honestly, once you learn one a visualization tool, or business intelligence tool, learning another one will be, it's, it's a straightforward. So the first one may have some complexity in there, but moving, in, uh, to different ones, they will have the like, same goals, uh, but it depends a lot on what your client is already familiar with. We have recommended sometimes to use Power BI because some clients like to use Excel, uh, and Excel is a good visualization tool, and it's the one that is most used, actually. We want sometimes to use fancier tools, and clients want Excel. Um, but if you have um, some business needs that Power BI will be better, moving from Excel to Power BI is not a, um, such a big move to your clients, so you can do that as well. So it depends a lot on what you are using. Uh, we have used QuickSight as well, because we are already, we have everything in AWS and integration is better. So yeah, it's, there's not like one answer or an easy answer, it depends, yeah. Yeah. Is there much difference in your process between when you're generating regular reports for a client's own use versus embedding some sort of data visualization or uh, report for public use, let's say, on a website? Yes. So you need to know what data is sensitive. If you have PII, if you have financial data, if you have uh, proprietary data. Mm -hmm. So there are some indicators that you don't want them to be um, there. So sometimes what we do is we have like an internal, uh, well internal for the clients that they can use and do their own discovery. And whatever they want to be uh, public, then what we can do is some aggregations. Instead of uh, having all the data, we can do aggregations, we can uh, do what we mean, we call suppression of data, which is removing um, the sensitive uh, data in there. But yeah, and um, we also have, so this is the data that we are going to use for internally, mm -hmm. and then we do another processing to, to precisely do that, so we will have. How you use it, how to decide if you have to add that, is it based on the business needs or based on just communication? Yeah, it needs to be something that your client really wants to know. Sometimes we can get excited that, oh, we can guess uh, how many events we'll have next month, but maybe that's not what they want. Uh, so yeah, it, those will come with the discovery that you are doing first. Um, if you find that there's some struggle to find out the resources planning, so maybe you can um, do some predictions in there. In, in the medical space, the, I, I remember a need of, of knowing in, in certain locations if there are going to be uh, how many cases of diabetes uh, or heart problems, so you can do that kind of uh, prediction. Um, of course, you will need some historical data to be able to, to do that, to, to do that. Um, but that can help with those uh, resources planning. But that's, like a business need that you need to find out by working with your client and looking into the data. For sure. I think there was another question right there. Very good. All right, well, thank you very much. Again, I am Yvonne Carrillo. This is my uh, LinkedIn, please connect. Uh, at Bixel, we love data. So please reach out. We, we are trying to build a, a data community as well of data professionals and data enthusiasts. Uh, it, so please reach out. And also one um, personal goal of mine, I, I want to build my networking of women in technology. So by all means, please reach out. I will be more than happy to support you in any way I can. Thank you.